And good hello once again to another of these lecture videos by me, L.C. Lupus, or at least that is a name I go by on the internet and in my writings. So, um, this is yet another of the videos in which I explore some kind of a literary topic, and in this case we're going to be looking at myth, uh, in specific, uh, you know, uh, cultural myths, as especially espoused by Roland Barthes, but also by Thwaites, uh, who we'll look at a bit more later it, it is mostly based around the model of of Roland Barthes though. so what is myth now the immediate thing to just know is that in this sense myth does not mean uh you know um myth is not uh you know like greek myth or you know roman myth or something like that it's not a, a mythological you know like ancient gods or whatever whatever's it's not like that that is different which also makes it a little bit um a little bit irritating because there isn't really a clear definition for what is and is not necessarily a myth um but yes we're going to get into it <laughs> so a myth in this sense are cultural myths so um we're going to to go more into this but essentially the idea is that something has become seen as uh, real and correct when it um, isn't. Basically, something that is ob uh, subjective has been turned into something within culture that is perceived as objective. Nothing is actually objective, but it's perceived as such. So that is what it is. Now, firstly, you you need you need to know semiotics for this. Uh, it is literally based on semiotics. It uses uh, the Saussurean model. It uses you know. Um, uh, signifier and signifieds to to explore these ideas. So uh, I have done a video about Caesarian semiotics. I would recommend going and checking out that video uh, if you are um, you know uncertain of Caesarian semiotics. You can find it shortly before this video. Really, you can just type in LC Lupus uh, Ferdinand de Saussure or semiotics will probably come up. Um, so yes. That model, just as a quick overview, though, is that uh, signifiers are things, physical things in the world. So it could be a word, an image, or something. And the signified is what it means, basically, in very, very simple terms. And together they make up what's called a sign. You know, a sign is a combination of a signifier and a signified. I'm going to be using these terms quite, um, you know, casually. So that's why you need to know these terms. Uh, it's quite, um, you know important <laughs> to know these terms and how they can uh, uh, how they are used here to create a myth so basically the idea is that a sign remember a sign is something that is culturally determined right uh, it doesn't actually have intrinsic meaning it is arbitrary um, the fact that the word tree means that thing that grows out of the ground that has a you know a trunk and leaves that is uh, arbitrary because another word, from another language can mean the exact same thing, right? In Afrikaans, uh, boom means tree. So there is nothing special about the word tree or boom that makes it more or less correct than either of them. So the sounds used in the signifier uh, in this particular case uh, are entirely arbitrary in relation to what they mean. So sounds don't have definitive meanings. We ascribe those meanings onto them. However, <clears throat> in society, signs become naturalized. Basically, we see them as something just as that is natural. It's just part of the world. So uh, a good example is traffic lights, right? Traffic lights, red, uh, yellow, and, uh, and green. Red means stop. Yellow or orange or amber, or whatever, means... Uh, slow down or stop or it also means like you know if you're right about to get to the the light you kind of drive on because stopping would actually be quite dangerous at that point but it, it basically means you know caution slow down whatever and then green means go however we've just sort of now become naturalized with those if you were to change the colors you would really really mess with people because we've just become naturalized to those ideas, those colors. Those particular colors mean those particular things in that particular context. And so changing it, like imagine if we decided, imagine if they, they put out a notice saying, from now on, red light is going to mean go and, uh, and green is going to mean stop. Imagine how many accidents there would be. Because 
that is the kind of thing that would take a very, very, very long time, <laughs> an extremely long time, to um, to to understand. <laughs> and we we would just take ages to to be able to flip over to that particular uh, mentality because it's it's it would be very unnatural to us basically um, to be able to do that. So that is, that is the the essential. Uh, thing to keep in mind here. They become naturalized. So they essentially feel like they're objective. They feel like they are fact. They're not. You know, green does not mean go. Green is a color. Green has different meanings based on the context in which it is. And that's also why, you know, these meanings can change based on context. But in the context of the traffic lights, we see it as natural, right? Uh, when you see a red, uh, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you see a red sign with a single word on it in, in that kind of uh, octangular, I don't actually know how many sides it has, but that particular si that particular sign, and then you go, oh, that that's a stop sign. That is a stop sign. Everywhere in the world, that is a stop sign. I don't need to be able to read the word on it because I know that that means stop. <laughs> it has become naturalized because it's become kind of universalized around the world. Okay, so... That is sort of the beginnings of, a, of, of the naturalization of signs. And when certain signs become naturalized, they can become myths. Okay, so when we start to think that something is natural, it, in terms of a sign, it's, it's not. It is something that's actually culturally encoded rather than intrinsically natural. So some of these common kinds of things which become myths are... You know, these so-called cultural myths are things like, say, patriotism, capitalism, uh, femininity, masculinity, these kind of things. They're not actually natural. They are cultural. They are determined by the culture in which you live. That is why they are different based on where you are. They're not actually natural. They're not a thing that you know, you're born with. You're not born with the instinct to care about your country. You care about your country or not necessarily care about your country, but you have a sense of immense pride in your country, basically because you're brainwashed from, from birth to believe that your country is special and unique. Um, and every other country also believes that it is special and unique. And um, I mean, when everyone is special and unique, is, every, is anyone really special and unique? But anyway, so this idea of sort of it being uh, culturally coded becomes a kind of cultural semiotics. So it's a f sort of part of a broader uh, cultural studies in general, understanding why we believe the things that we believe based on sort of cultural signs and cultural uh, ideas, beliefs, myths, etc. Now, these myths can be reinforced through linguistic and non-linguistic means, which means it's a bit of a, a departure from Saussure's basic model, which is very linguistic uh, in nature. This can incorporate non-linguistic things, so images and things like that. Uh, it does not have to actually be linguistic. It can be, basically, it doesn't have to be based on language. It can be based on something that is not language. So, you know, that could work in its own sense. Okay, so, cool, great. Um, <laughs> so now, what happens when we want to interrogate these things, which now these kinds of things become naturalized, Right. When you live in a certain country, you're, I use the word brainwash, which I suppose is quite a strong term, but it is also true. You could also use indoctrinated um, into a patriotic belief. Now, we think of these things as natural, right? We're like, oh, you know, but it's natural to be patriotic about your country, to think other countries are worse than yours um, f with no real evidence to support that. Um, we might want to question and understand where these sorts of ideas come from. And that is what uh, myth-making in the terms of, you know, Roland Barthes, that's where this comes into play. We have to start going, well, where do these myths come from and how can we interrogate them? Now, myths are, are present within very physical things. You know, you can find them within textbooks in schools, you can find them in posters, you can find them in, you know, images, you can find them in books, you can find them all over the place. And they are reinforced through various means. Now, in the sort of second half of this video, we are going to actually interrogate a specific uh, text that reinforces a certain myth, which should be super interesting, I'm sure, uh, because it's the kind of thing that you might need to do if you're doing this on a university level. 
So, remember, just like all semiotics, these cultural signs are still arbitrary. They're not dictatorial. So, basically, just because something seems a certain way does not mean that it is necessarily true. We have just kind of been led to believe that it is true. We've been, uh, we've had this reinforced on us and told that this is the way it is. This is the way it's supposed to be. Blah, 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 blah. Right? When it's not necessarily the case. Okay. So, something to also keep in mind is that certain people will try to act as if these cultural myths are real. That they are objective. That they, they'll be like, no, 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 it's not arbitrary. It is real. You know, there is a correct masculinity. There is a correct femininity. There is a correct patriotism. There is a correct etc, etc. There isn't. Um, it's, it's entirely cultural. It's not objective. It's not natural. We have just been led to believe that it is natural. This happens very easily. When something is just commonly part of your life, uh, you think it is natural. So let, let take, for instance, uh, wearing clothes. Very, very simple. Wearing clothes. Your entire life, in all likelihood, as, but there are some cultures that aren't like this, but in all likelihood, you've been raised to believe that you have to wear clothes. And you've been told that this is natural. It is natural to wear clothes. When, when you just think about it for a few seconds, human beings are a type of animal. Animals don't naturally wear clothes we have justifications for it. For instance, in the Christian faith, there is justification in Genesis for wearing clothes. Like that is how early on, it's in the first few chapters of the Bible that the justification for wearing clothing is reinforced. It's because we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we realized we were naked and we were ashamed of that. And so we started wearing clothing, basically, uh, which is sad. But you know, that's the thing. It comes from this idea of shame and that we're supposed to have shame about the naked body when the naked body shouldn't be something that you're ashamed of. The human body is a beautiful thing. So why are you ashamed of it? But, you know, that's its own conversation. So when we want to learn about these things, about myths, we analyze, uh, we analyze various things. As I said, you know, could look at books or whatever. Now, a really, really good thing to look at is adverts. That's what we're going to look at. But you can look at kind of popular culture in general. Popular culture is what reinforces these ideas in our minds, right, in, in the present day. So, yeah, that is what we are going to look at, right? And now something that's also very important is that it is interdisciplinary, right? And I'm go there's going to be a video later about interdisciplinary stuff. Uh, but it is good to be interdisciplinary, to be able to understand cultural myths. You can't, uh, this is part of like literary theory, but it's a way of understanding the world itself, right? By looking at literary texts, which can mean all sorts of things. Like, for instance, adverts are a kind of literary text. It's presenting some kind of a narrative to you. It's presenting some kind of an idea to you. And so it is a kind of literature. However, to understand it, you also need to sort of know about human psychology and sociology and uh, culture and all sorts of things. So you sort of do need to know these things to be able to understand myth. So the more widely read you are, the more things you know, the better you'll be able to understand and identify cultural myths. That is very important in this particular case. Okay. Now, before we do actually jump into our analysis, which uses the uh, Thwaites model, we're not going to start that just yet. So first, where, do, where does this come from, this like, this myth idea? It comes from Roland Barthes, a book called Mythologies, which I would really recommend reading. Some of it can be a bit difficult to read at times, but it is very interesting where he will look at things like, say, um, he will look at things like professional wrestling, uh, steak and chips, wine, uh, and how these reinforce cultural ideas about the culture in which they are, uh, you know, that, where they are. It's a very interesting book. And it can change the way you look at sort of the world and what is all around us. So myths are these things, which is essentially like popular parts of popular culture and culture in general. They're variable. They have, um, they sort of take something that is subjective, as I've said, you know, some sub sort of an opinionated thing. It's a cultural thing and it makes it seem like it is concrete. 
right? But the problem is that he doesn't really define myth itself. Um, so we have had to sort of figure out what exactly he means by myth. So now we're going to jump into, uh, at this particular point, we're going to now jump into um, the, the, the an actual analysis using Thwaites' model. So Thwaites basically took the ideas that... Um, that Bart was speaking about, and he made it into actually like a five-point uh, system that would be e more easily understood by people who want to, you know, uh, learn about this kind of stuff, you know, to, to make it a bit easier. So in this particular case, I'm going to be looking at a um, particular example of myth that is expressed within a McDonald's advert. It's quite a famous uh, and often uh, mocked McDonald's advert, but I think it's a very, very good one for identifying the myth of um, meat consumption and its connections to uh, basically misogyny. So uh, my main area actually is in literary theory, but with a specific focus on animal studies. So this is why I probably chose this because I have a bias. Now, let's look at this particular um, advert. Now, it has a couple of things here. You can see it's got some text at the top, the bottom. It's got a burger in the middle, and it's got like a satin bedspread on which it is set. So, it says here, stop looking at, uh, stop staring at me like I'm some piece of meat. But of course, it is a piece of meat. And at the bottom there, it says in much smaller things, it says, you can look, but you can't touch. Okay, you can touch, but can you handle me? Check out my dimensions. To, uh, does it say oil? All beef, sorry, I have really bad eyes. Um, to all beef patties and juicy all over, uh, juicy all over, are you mac enough? And that's in bold. And then there's the McDonald's logo next to it. So, the Thwaites model has a couple things. Step one, identify the signifiers. Step two, identify the potential signifieds for those signifiers. Step three, select the key signified for those particular signifiers. And the same step four, Explain how those signs are used. And step five, identify the myth that the text is presenting. Cool. So you can see now why I said you need to kind of know the Saussurian semiotic model because it's very much Ferdinand the Saussure's model, like it straight, you know, completely. So let's identify the signifiers. Well, there's some language here. There's a top and the bottom. They'll stop staring at me like I'm some piece of meat which is a signifier. There is the signifier uh, that is the text at the bottom, including the final phrase that is in bold. That is a separate signifier. The burger is a signifier. And of course, also the satin bedspread is a signifier. So there's some signifiers. There's what? One, two, three, four. Uh, you can say like four signifiers, uh, primary signifiers. So step two, identify the potential signifieds for those signifiers. So what do these signifiers mean? What, what, are, the, what are the signifieds for them? So, stop staring at me like I'm some piece of meat. This is a common expression that is used especially by women um, to have this, this image of you are being, a, a woman is being objectified and treated like a piece of meat, right? It's a very common expression you often see. You will also hear a lot of the time that people who are... Um, uh, the survivors of sexual assault will use the expression that they were treated like a piece of meat. So immediately there's actually a connection to femininity and a connection to sexualization in this particular thing. Now the second signifier, I'm going to use the, the second um, little, uh, piece of, of uh, text there where it says, you can look but you can't touch. Okay, you can touch but can you handle me? Check out my dimensions to uh, all beef patties and juicy all over. So you can look but you can't touch. Also a common sexual statement. Okay, you can you can touch, but can you handle me? That becomes also very, very sexualized. It also implies a certain kind of uh, reinforcement of sexual assault being fine. That gets be, it, it, it's fine. Check out my dimensions, which is also a, a very sneaky way of, you know, focusing on things like breast, thighs, the things that we use to define uh, woman's bodies, which also, ironically, are the same terms we use to define um, meat. Uh, but anyway, and then are you mac enough, which of course sounds like are you, uh, sorry, I left out the, uh, you know, uh, two beef patties and juicy all over. Juicy definitely has a sexual meaning there. So then are you mac enough, which now brings up ideas of masculinity, right? Are you man enough? You know, are you man enough to eat this meat burger that we've sexualized? Now, of course, you look at the actual meat burger itself, which is its own signifier. 
that is kind of presenting it as it is. This is what this Big Mac would look like that you uh, that is being sexualized. Um, and we're very much sort of going, yeah, would you like to um, have sex? I mean, not have sex with, would you like to eat? Yes, yes. Um, we're, 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 we're definitely not wanting you to have sex with this burger, even though that really seems like the implication of this particular burger of this particular advert. And of course, the satin bedspread, a red satin bedspread is very much associated with sexuality. You will often see this. It's kind of has a pornographic uh, image to it. So once again, it's reinforcing sexualization. So there we go. That's step two done. We've identified the meanings of these signifiers. Now, what are the key signifiers of these? Well, the key signifiers of all of these is sexualization, comparison to woman, and of course, um, consuming it as a man, as a masculine figure. So those are sort of the key things we're looking at here, right? Sex, woman, men. Those are the three things that we're looking at here. We're trying to draw a direct comparison to meat eating and masculinity. Very fun. So explain how these signs are step four. Explain how the signs are used. Well, we've kind of already done that, but you can go into it more in depth, right? So now you're going to sort of say, well, why is there bold text at the top? Obviously, that's you're supposed to draw your attention to it. That's the first thing you often see. Stop staring at me like I'm some piece of meat. You see that first. And then your eyes naturally go down to the smaller text, which now you have to actually read. And the final statement is in bold, which is really trying to reinforce this masculine ideal of meat consumption. And also, I mean, I don't eat meat anymore, but a Big Mac isn't like some big manly meal. It's just a sandwich. Basically, like a, a burger is a, a special bigger sandwich. Um... You know, you can dress it up all you like. It's just the type of sandwich. It's not like it's a manly thing to be able to eat a burger. Uh, it's really not that difficult to eat a burger. Um, so, yeah, the signs are used like that. And then, of course, the placement. This will be an important thing. The placement of the text, right? You, your eye is drawn to the bulb at the top. And then that allows your eyes to scale down to the bottom which then reinforces the final bold at the very, very end with that final statement, or are you Mac enough? Which also then leads into the logo, because of course this is an advert. And then you will look at the actual image. So your eyes are naturally drawn to the text. Eyes tend to be naturally drawn to text, so that's how it's used. And it's at the top because it wants you to really see it. Then it wants you to see the image, right? And it's sort of saying, have a look at this burger. This burger, which we have done our very best to sexualize because we want you to have an association between sex and eating uh, i guess they're both primal activities but we're sort of saying look at this piece of meat don't you want to just yum 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 just have this tasty tasty burger it's lying on this bedspread just waiting for you to just yeah, just go at it i i'm i'm also really struggling to not directly quote the words of H. Bomber guy because he he specifically made fun of this particular uh <laughs> this particular um advert but it's quite a classic advert uh but his words just stick out very very well because it's very true uh but I'm not going to use those particular words because he does swear and I'm trying to keep this very uh very um open for anyone who wants to to learn these educational things so you can now see how they're all used, right? The burger's placed on a bedspread to better reinforce this idea of um, of it being something sexual and it being something that is supposed to be desirable and you want it. And if you're a real man, you would eat this meat, wouldn't you? You just stuff it in your mouth and just... It's very weird. Um, and I also probably made it weirder by speaking like that. But I mean, that's what it deserves. So step five, what 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 myth is this text giving us? Well, it is trying to present the idea that meat eating is a masculine activity. That is the, and it's trying to reinforce that meat eating is also something good and also strong. You're strong for wanting to eat meat. You're, you're a big manly man, aren't you? And as you know, big manly men, you know, they like, they like women. Oh yeah. Yeah. Manly men. They like, they like chicks, don't they? And they like sex and they also like meat. And so let's compare meat and sex together. Let's make it, oh yeah, it's just a really big, sexy meat burger that you can just stuff in your mouth like a woman. That's kind of the myth it's trying to present, which once again, I made it weird because wh why not? I like making things weird. And this is a very, very weird advert. It's, it's very weird, but uh, it's fine. Whatever. 
So that is what it's trying to present to us. It's trying to say, meat eating is manly. Meat eating is masculine. You should want to eat meat. You should want to just stuff that meat in your mouth. I know, I'm weird. But that is what it is presenting to you. So that is the myth. And that's kind of how you would end an essay. <laughs> Maybe not being as weird as me. Uh, but I am doing this for, for exaggerated reasons. Because I personally find it funny. And what I find funny, I will I will pursue. So, yeah. Anyway, so that is myth making. And that is how you would also interrogate a particular um, myth. Uh, adverts are an amazing place to find myth. Wow. Look at adverts. You will see so many reinforcements of myth. Look at like a detergent advert. Any detergent advert. If it's for soap, detergent, washing powder, uh, you know, whatever. Just look at adverts. It will pretty much always be a woman, usually in like a, uh, a lot of the time, actually it depends. So in South Africa, you get like a brand like Omo. And a lot of the Omo adverts will have a woman, uh, usually a black woman. They'll have a black woman in a more uh, modest household because they want to reinforce the idea that this this brand isn't for, for rich people. It's for people who... Who, who need to have their clothes washed, but they don't have some extremely expensive washing machine. It's, it's building a myth around itself. It's sort of saying, this is who it's for. Adverts are an amazing place to find myth. Uh, so if you're going to analyze uh, myth and you're writing an essay about analyzing myth, find an advert. Adverts are great at it. Adverts, look at how many, uh, look at booze adverts, right? Look at some drinks. Look at how the different ones do it, right? Beer, always. Oh, beer, yeah, it's manly, yeah, you know. A lot of people just drinking this beer and it's so, like, cool. You know, oh, we're just drinking beer. We're manly men together and it's going to be men sitting around drinking beer and being guys together. That is what beer adverts always do. Always. Whereas if you were to see an advert for, like, I don't know, I've never, I don't think I've seen a wine advert. Maybe it's just classier than beer. But if you were to look at, like, say, a wine advert, it might have more sophisticated people drinking from their little, their little glasses, and it might have men and women together looking all sophisticated, sipping on wine. Even though you get a lot of really cheap wine, like box wine, it's very cheap. But that's the thing; it's trying to reinforce this image of wine as something sophisticated, even when you're buying some cheap wine. <laughs> it's still something. It's more sophisticated than drinking beer. Beer is for, you know, the manly guys who are talking like this, you know. The different types have different things associated with them, right? I remember like a, a vodka advert. If a vodka advert was like honest, it would it would show somebody, some people drinking vodka and then passing out on a park bench. Um, that would be like an accurate vodka advert. But no, it's going to have a bunch of people chilling together, drinking from their little tumblers and being all sophisticated. No one's doing shots because shots aren't, you know, shots are the the, the, the seedy underbelly of, of alcohol. No, 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 you're not going to have shots in an advert. No one's doing shot. No one's doing shooters. People are drinking casually with a, a glass, uh, you know, like a nice glass and some, some ice. Whoever drinks vodka like that, I, I, if you do, fine. I would never drink vodka like that. I don't like, but I'm not a drinker. So, you know, but you will see the way that it presents the myth it wants to present about the particular thing it does, right? If you're going to get an advert for, um, I, I don't know, a Kia Picanto, it's probably going to be like, oh, look at this cute little car. If it's going to have an advert for a, a, a Land Rover, it's going to be like, oh, look at how this can drive over mountains. Yeah, because this is a, a manly car that can, it can, it's manly and it can, it can drive over rocks and it's a four by four. And rah! You see, it, it presents a different image, all of it, which is absolute nonsense. Having a big car doesn't make you a man. I've seen many women who drive big cars. Doesn't make them manly either. It's just a car. Stop attaching your identity to something so sad. But anyway, that is myth. Uh, I'm now going on like off on tangents. But yes, if you want to analyze it, adverts are great. Because they have so many myths in them. They're absolute nonsense most of the time. So go for it. Enjoy it. And that has been everything. Uh, so I've been Elsie Lupus. Um, if you enjoyed this, you can also check out possibly my books. My latest book is Flesh Zone Blues, which is uh, 
actually interrogates a bunch of myths. Uh, it breaks some things down. It, it mocks a lot of these things, like, say, capitalism. It's not a very, uh, it's quite an anti-capitalist book. Uh, it's an anti-authoritarian book, probably an anti-cop book. Uh, it breaks down a lot of those kinds of things and mocks them. Uh, it also breaks down myths of what is, what it means to be human. So a lot of things like that. It's a cyberpunk story. Uh, it's very sad and um, horrible and miserable. Um, but it's fun. So, yeah. You can check that out in the description. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this, please do the, 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 the liking and the subscribing. That really does help. And also, of course, if you have any questions, please pop them in the comments. Uh, those can really, uh, you know, because I can often uh, further explain things in the comments. Or if you have a literary concept, literature is my main area. So maybe don't ask me about uh, physics. I'm afraid I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very dumb when it comes to physics and maths and other things. But if you have literary concepts that you'd like explored, please, you can put them in the comments and I'll, if I know them, I might even make a video about them uh, if it's like a bigger topic. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, inform me of such things. And otherwise, I uh, hope you have a great uh, day, week and month ahead. So, goodbye. <laughs>